Good morning, family. And the reading today is from, uh, is actually entitled, Jesus Comes to Jerusalem as King. And it's Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11, and verses 15 to 19. Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11, verses 15 to 19. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden, and tie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered, as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. May God bless his reading of his word to us this morning. The start of Holy Week, as we call it, is always a very interesting time for me. Um, I go through the week, and I don't just... I know that Jesus rose again and the joy that will come on Easter Sunday. However, I purposefully go through the emotions that the disciples must have gone through. It must have been an utter roller coaster for them <laughs> and uh, of the triumphal entry, of Jesus predicting his death, and then going through to down to Gethsemane, and then the devastation of the trial, the denial, the desertion, the whipping, the horrible experiences that Jesus, their very wonderful friend and master, went through and then nailed on the cross. So I, I do suggest that you go with us, go with me through this week and let's recognize that this was a difficult week for them. They must have thought the world had gone mad. Let's see whether we can... Oh, there we go. I'd forgotten that I'd done that. A world gone bananas. The world is bonkers, isn't it? Rosie put it in rather a nice way. There's a lot to think about and pray about this morning. 
But we live in a mad, 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 mad... I don't know how many in the film there is with the Spencer Tracy. That's a very old film. But it's a mad world. Who's in charge, for goodness sake? <laughs> the guy who plays the accordion while he's speaking? Joe Biden? Is it Mr. Putin, who's bombing Kiev this morning? Is it Rishi Sunak, or is it <laughs> Boris Johnson? Um, this is the uh, head of the UN, Mr. Gutierrez, Gutierrez. It's a Portuguese name, I think. Or is it um, somebody oh, more familiar? Are the Swifties actually running the world? Well, Mr. Trump thought so a couple of weeks ago, that he thought that if Taylor Swift actually backstroked Biden, he's lost. Or is it the Swifties? Or is it people power? Insulate Britain. Stop oil. Is it people power? Are the people actually in charge. Who's in charge? There are those who would like to be in charge, the first slide, and those who would like to make sure that they've got no chance whatsoever. Or is Greta Thunberg in charge? And when we look at the crisis that we've got in our climate, I think nobody is in charge. I watched Click this morning and they are dismantling nuclear power plants. It'll only take 300 years before the land can be used again. Oh dear. But we got a lot in common with what was happening at the time of Jesus. Um, there's a, a phrase, and let me get this completely wrong, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more that things change, the more they stay the same. And if you're impressed with my, my French, then that was got from a song by a group called Rush. Um, <laughs> that is in that song. But things don't change. Everything seems to be the same. It's as mad as when Jesus was around. Israel thought they were the bee's knees, but God took them into exile with Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, and Daniel got to play with the kitty cats. The law of the Medes and the Persians can't be changed, so if you don't do what is right, then you die. They were a dictatorship. Alexander, oops, gone too far. Alexander the Great. Oh, come on. You can't laugh in church this morning, you can't laugh, can you? Alexander the Great, who conquered right from Macedonia in Greece, right over to India. His, his kingdom was split into two. And eventually, Palestine was conquered by the gentlest, kindest sweetest people who you ever met in your, all of your born days, the Romans. Oh, I'm having trouble here. Augustus Caesar and Pompey were the ones who conquered. What Israel were looking for was a saviour, somebody like Judas Maccabeus. The Maccabean revolt during the time between the Testaments, there was a revolt the Jews were revolting, so the Romans thought. And they wanted to have a saviour. They needed a saviour. And here comes Jesus. Just as when we were looking at uh, Christmas time, all of these great prophecies about this wonderful saviour that was going to come, and who do we get? We get a baby, for goodness sake. God's not into doing things like we would like. Jesus rode in. Now, this is a map of where Jesus rode in from. Now, let me get this correct. From the right-hand side, down the Mount of Olives, past where Jesus would eventually go to the Garden of Gethsemane, 
into the city and the temple. You see the temple is right on the right-hand side of Jerusalem there. So when you went into the city from the east gate, you went into the temple. Traditionally, that's where the Messiah was going to enter. Which is why the religious leaders threw their toys out the pram at that point, because they were worried. If the Romans find out that there's a new king come to Jerusalem, a new king come to town, there would be bloodshed. Now, what they were looking for was a savior in their image. And I found this, Jesus riding on a raptor. That's what they wanted, not a donkey, a raptor. That's, it's great, isn't it? Jurassic Park. How do I find these? Yes, at the moment, everybody's going, how did you find these? Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you riding along a velociraptor. No, he didn't. He came riding on a donkey. But in that... Jesus was doing two things. He was claiming that he was king of the city, which was an extremely dangerous political act. And two, he was king of the temple. He was king of their social and political life, and he was king of their religious and spiritual life. The lot, in other words, everything. He was king of everything. So he rides in on a donkey. Oops, I've gone too far again. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous, victorious, lowly, riding on a donkey, on a colt. The foal of a donkey, a baby donkey, basically. Time of Zechariah, they needed the velociraptor. But but Zechariah says he's riding on a donkey. Jesus doesn't ride like a great conquering king, blasting with an M. What was it? Forgotten what my guns are. I mean, we've got military people in here, and I don't know what a gun is. Um, uh, an AK 47, that was it. <laughs> he doesn't come with an AK 47. He rides on a donkey and gently and lovingly and acceptingly of all peoples, all types of people. It didn't matter. All these. The Bible talks about the scum of the earth. I said last week about the scum of the earth. We are. But the hoi polloi, the people, the ordinary people, not the kings, not the princes, not the power brokers, no, no, not the bankers, not the politicians, not the film stars or the the singers. He comes for the people. And he comes in and he claims that city Now, it's interesting that all of these Old Testament passages say a great deal about what Jesus was doing. Jesus arranged carefully. He clearly had gone to this person and said, I need your donkey for an afternoon, if you don't mind. Yeah, fine, Jesus. And so they give them the donkey. And Jesus knew that riding in the East Gate into Jerusalem on a donkey, a foal of a donkey, all the religious leaders, all the theologians among them would be going, oh my word, we are toast. We are dead meat. We are dead in the water. Mixing my metaphors a little bit, boiling, frying and everything. So we are dead. They knew and Jesus knew what he was doing. It was a pretty terrible thing to do. Maybe the disciples understood this. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they just thought it was great. They were going on a, it's Mardi Gras, let's go. It's a high. But maybe they understood. The city authorities 
certainly understood. We'll come to that in a minute. But this is another thing, that they were shouting, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And here's a quick hint. If you get an Old Testament um, quote in the New Testament, go back and look at the context of the Old Testament, okay? So, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's in Psalm 118, which is a song which was sung when they crowned a king. Ooh, that's even more dangerous. So, they knew what they were saying. Blessed he, he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Matthew has the Lord saves. Hosanna. So, all of this was claiming that he was the king. And it says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures. Excuse me. His love endures forever. And it reminds me of that fantastic, deep-thinking theologian, Mrs. Beaver, from, um, from Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It is the most profound statement of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Is Aslan safe? Of course he's not safe. He's a lion. <laughs> Lions ain't safe. Remember Daniel and the kitties? Well, he is a kitty cat that is very big and very scary. The Lion of Judah. But he is good. And his love does endure forever. And he's on your side. He's not on the side of the powerful. This claiming of the city was very, very important. Because we tend to spiritualize and individualize our faith. And we tend to think that it is Jesus who just saved me. Whereas the Bible, 1 John 2, says he didn't only die for the elect, he died for the whole world. Now the world has got to decide whether it's going to accept that or not. That's up to them. But he's cleared away the sin. He's done his job. And he has opened the way by being king of the city of Jerusalem. But he also claimed the temple. Oh, it's going to go. Oh, there, I knew it. Oh, two back, two forward. Two back, two forward. I'm not very good at this, am I? You'd have thought. Well, it's a picture of Jesus turning over the tables. It doesn't matter. Okay, so Jesus claimed the city, but he also claimed the temple. And Jesus says two things. There's a quote. Two quotes, sorry. And again, let's look at the whole of the passage. She says that my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And this is what Isaiah 56 says. Foreigners who bind themselves, non-Jews in other words, Gentiles, us, who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, all who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burned offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations." Now, Jesus, where Jesus marched into was there, the court of the Gentiles. The Gentiles were not allowed in the old temple, into the inner part of the temple. They had to stay in the court of the Gentiles. And sorry, girls, the women. Court of the Gentiles, court of the women, same place. And what was going on was, you had... You couldn't make your sacrifices, you couldn't buy your sacrifices anywhere except at the temple. It was a closed shop, basically. And they sold the lambs, and they sold the pigeons, and they sold the doves in the temple. So 
The Sadducees, who were running the temple, could set the price. It wasn't supply and demand. There was no other demand outside, and they were the only suppliers. So they set the price wherever they liked. And so the poor people coming in had to buy their sacrifices there. That's what they were doing. What's more is they couldn't buy with their own currency. They had to have temple currency. So there was an exchange rate. And the exchange rate, well, you can probably guess that it didn't actually benefit the people. Okay, it benefited the people who ran the temple. So here we got a clothes shop. You can't buy your sacrifices anywhere where you want to be faithful to God. You've got to buy it here. And you've got to buy it at a high price. And what's more, you've got to buy it with our money. And we've got a really good price for you. Can you imagine the money changes on the side of the... Yes, mate. It's like a Tottenham car dealer. I mean, I've got a great deal for you, mate. Right round here. Yes. So this is what Jesus came to. And he looked around and he see all these people. He knew that his father wanted all the nations, every nation on he- in heaven and on earth to worship. And they weren't being allowed to because the religious leaders had got everything stitched up. And so Jesus says, you have made it into a den of robbers. That's the film, Den of Rebels. I've never seen it before, actually, with Jared Butler. It's probably quite violent. You have made it into a den of robbers. This Jeremiah 7, where the people were saying, oh, but we got the temple. We're all right. We got the temple. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, says Jeremiah. It's all right. No worries. And God says, no, you'll be dragged out of here. Because unless you do justice, and unless you let people to come to me, you're not doing your job properly. And again, we might be thinking, well, you know, that's your interpretation, Paul. But the religious leaders knew exactly what he was doing. And a few verses later, they say, by what authority do you do these things? These things looking at the wrecked tables and the pigeons flying off into the distance and the lamb going out the door and everything. Impersonation of a lamb. I've been trying, doing this all week. So by what authority do you have to do this? Because he's king. Because he's lord. And he's claiming lordship over Jerusalem over its politics, and over the religious, the spirituality of the people. So what does that mean for us? Jesus Christ is the cent- should be the center of our lives. Now, there is a theologian, no, not Mrs. Beaver. Uh, he wrote a book he used to quote quite regularly, this is Karl Barth, he used to quote quite regularly from Ecclesiastes, God is in heaven and thou art on earth, therefore let your words be few. And then he wrote a theology of six million words. <laughs> there you go. I don't know anybody who's read the whole of church dogmatics. But he joked one time and he said, so, yes, Jesus Christ. Oh, sorry, what was the question? Because the answer is Jesus Christ. Who, who deserves your loyalty? Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, what was the question? And we are called Christians. In, F, in the first time it was in, oh, I always forget, Ephesus or Antioch. Antioch, that they were called Christians. Why? Because they were going on, banging on about this Christ person all the time. And this is our Lord. He is our Lord, whether we like it or not. We can actually say, okay, Lord, that's great. I will, I will come under your authority, but we know that he's good. 
and he's loving and he wants the best for us more than we want the best for ourselves. We talk a great deal about mental health today and I tell you, it improves your mental health when you come under the authority of Jesus Christ who loves you enough to get pinned to a cross. So we've got to live like the Lordship of Jesus over our lives. That's really quite simple. What would Jesus do? Well, flipping tables over and making a whip is, is actually an option, apparently. When somebody says, the next time somebody says to you, what would Jesus do? You go, oh, he would have made a whip and turned the tables over. Oh, I wasn't really thinking of that. Somebody said that WWJD actually meant we want your donuts. Um, what would Jesus do? Look at the Gospels. What did he do? He healed the sick. He associated himself with those who, who nobody cared for. He preached God's word. What would Jesus do? He'd go out and he'd just love people, whether they deserved it or not, and especially those of us who don't deserve it. Me. And we are living examples of this. When the world looks at Christians and says, what a bunch of judgmental, nasty people they are. It's not God's fault. That's our fault. And we're misrepresenting who he is. Loving, caring, hard-nosed Jesus Christ. He was meek and mild, yes, but he wasn't weak and watery. He was very very strong, and he is strong to save. And on Palm Sunday, we can, with everyone else, say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Because he's our Lord as well as the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we stand in wonder at your love. We also want to confess that we are sad examples, sad reflections of that love. We don't do what you would have done. Help us to know you, to know you, to love you, and to live out your gospel in a world gone bananas. Because we know that ultimately, you are in charge. You will bring justice. You will bring oppression to an end. You will bring persecution to an end. In the meantime, help us to fight, for, fight that injustice and fight for justice. Help us to speak your word out with the love and the grace that you demonstrated in Jesus, and we ask it in his name. Amen.